I'll give you five dates. August 26, 2021. Nearly 200 Afghans, 13 US Special Forces mostly, Marines as well, die in a bombing outside the airport in Kabul. Counterterrorism threat. But there are other dates that will go to the diversification of the threats and it will speak to the diversification of the panel that we're just about to have. January 6th, violent right-wing domestic extremism. December 30th, 2019, Dr. Ai Fen of the Wuhan Central Hospital tells her medical school classmates that she has been treating a coronavirus with apparent human-to-human -human transmission. One of those classmates was Dr. Li Wenliang, the whistleblower in China who would later die of COVID. 2030, the date by which the UN says we have to cut global emissions by 45% or, well, or else, frankly. And 2050, the date by which Nigeria will have 400 million people, become the third most populous country on the planet, the population in Africa will have doubled compared to today. Africa adds the equivalent of the population of France every two years. So those are the dates I want you to keep in mind as we talk about what the next 9-11 might be. I am aware before we start that we are the only things between you and lobsters. <laughs> so we will keep our brilliance brief and we'll, we'll keep it a little short. Um, Senator Tim Kaine of Virginia, member of the Senate Armed Services Committee and Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Dr. Fatima Akilu is the executive director of Neem Foundation, a crisis response organization dedicated to people living through conflict, violence, and fragility. She's also a visiting senior research fellow at King's College in London, and she designed Nigeria's Countering Violent Extremism Program. Duad Ludin is the co-founder uh, and president of the Heart of Asia Society, a think tank the former Deputy Foreign Minister for Political Affairs for the former Afghan government, and of course, Af Afghan Ambassador to Canada uh, from 2009, 2011. Uh, and Constanza Stetz Mueller, I tried, I'm sorry, <laughs> Stelzen Mueller, uh, the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations at the Brookings Institution. Thank you very much, welcome to all of you. Joad Ludin, let me start with you. Um, What's the threat globally that you believe emanates from Afghanistan today? Um, the threat, um, because uh, it, we didn't deal with the threat that emanated from it uh, 20 years ago, um, I believe uh, that probably is primarily the, the threat that uh, could emanate from Afghanistan in the future. Uh, uh, not only that we didn't deal with it uh, in a decisive manner, uh, but the way I think that the war um, was ended uh, may have, in fact, provided further uh, uh, impetus to, the, to the, re you know, the threat that continues to be there around the world, and particularly in that part of the world. And I'm just not talking about Afghanistan when it comes to... Uh, to uh, the threat of ex Islamist, uh, Islamic extremism and, and, and terrorist groups, uh, Afghanistan is only a part of the bigger region. <coughs> um, and Taliban's victory uh, 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 three months ago, uh, there's reason to believe uh, may have given, and in fact it has given, uh, significant uh, uh, boosting of morale uh, to uh, to those who are still uh, 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 maybe uh, trying to to hurt uh, global security, uh, the uh, uh, there are some uh, opportunities as well. Uh, uh, but I think the the world will be mistaken if they think uh, the way to ensure uh, that the Taliban victory does not lead to a strengthening of uh, of, of terrorist groups. Uh, would be to actually work with the Taliban on this one and to take them uh, on their words uh, uh, because they've signed an agreement. Uh, it would be a mistake because uh, 
Taliban uh, are very poorly equipped uh, to deliver on their promises. Um, it was one stage for them to come to today. Uh, and, and, and the signing of the agreement with the United States was, was a step in that direction for them. Now is an entirely different ball game. Let's remember the Taliban have uh, roots, and that those roots are not very different uh, from the same groups that, uh, that could pose a threat to, to global security. Taliban themselves may not, but other groups do. So, uh, so I think the most important thing would be for uh, now that a, a very irresponsible exit has in fact happened, and there is probably no <coughs> point in going back and, and discussing that, uh, but now the important thing is to engage with the Taliban, but also to make sure that finally we find the strategic competence, uh, if I may borrow a term used by General McMaster that I heard a, a, a couple of days ago, uh, strategic competence to deal with this and, and, uh, and, and actually uh, uh, see how we can make sure that Afghanistan, that's now governed by Taliban, can never be used as a, as a staging uh, uh, pad for, for, for a threat to the rest of the world. Constanza, do you believe that the nature of the withdrawal uh, inspired or can inspire disaffected groups, perhaps even in the West? I think yes, un unquestionably. Um, I think I should perhaps explain. I was a, a journalist uh, when 9-11 happened. Uh, I was in Washington a month later for a month, and I was on the ground in Afghanistan in January 2002, and went back to Afghanistan a number of times. So I came in at the ground floor early. Um, and I have vivid memories of just how deprived and just war-weary Afghan, ordinary Afghans were. Uh, how fathers wanted their daughters to finally go to school. Women wanted to finally get out of the house. And how happy everybody was for them to be gone. I remember going to a NATO Afghan national team uh, football game, soccer game, orchestrated in the main Afghan national stadium in January, uh, recruited out of the four national Afghan football teams. You know that the Afghans are yes. soccer crazy. <laughs> and this was the same soccer stadium where the Taliban used to do executions or mutilations at halftime. And so I have to tell you, I, I was astonished at how emotionally gripped I was by the nature of the withdrawal and how, um, how personally I took it. So I think there are two consequences that we have to talk about. Yes, it is, it, I think it is entirely possible that the Taliban may see fit to become enablers again for the forms of uh, terrorism that led to 9-11 in the first place. But I think we should also pay attention to the fact that an entire generation of Western military and civil servants have their, their working identities and lives bound up with this mission, and I think are traumatized by the somewhat less than honorable nature of the withdrawal and the evacuation. And that this also, I think, should lead us to question ourselves. And, and, and do you believe it can inspire these groups, these groups, whether in Europe or the U.S.? Yes. Yeah. Short answer is yes. <laughs> Senator Kane, I wonder from, from your perspective, uh, the title of, of the talk, um, where do you believe the next 9-11, not necessarily a violent event, uh, can come from? Uh, and are we prepared? Um, I think I'm going to answer this question very differently than I would have answered a year ago with my colleagues who are here. The experience of being in the Capitol when it was under attack on January 6th makes me, the roar shock that I have to the next 9-11 is an inside job. It's an inside job, not just in the United States, but in the, in the world's democracies. I'm going I'm to read you a quote. So today is the anniversary of the Gettysburg Address in 1863, no, November 19. And as you know, that speech is a deep thinking person trying to make sense of massive bloodshed caused by internal civil strife and division within a democracy. President Lincoln gave a speech 25 years before in Springfield, Illinois that predicted where he would be. That's, it's a speech to the Young Men's Lyceum of Springfield. And he was asking about what's dangerous to the country. At what point shall we expect the approach of danger? By what means shall we fortify against it? 
Shall we expect some transatlantic military giant to step the ocean and crush us at a blow? Never. All the armies of Europe, Asia, and Africa combined with all the treasure of the earth in their military chest with a Bonaparte for a commander could not by force take a drink from the Ohio or make a track on the Blue Ridge if in a trial of a thousand years. At what point then is the approach of danger to be expected? I answer, if it ever reach us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and its finisher as a nation of free men we must live through all times or die by suicide. Wow. A powerful thought. And, you know, I, I, being in the Capitol on January 6th, and we all have our stories, I was furious. I was furious. I was furious at a president who said, come to Washington and do something wild. I was furious at those who did. I was furious at those of my colleagues. And all of my colleagues here did the right thing that day. But I was furious at those of my colleagues who, even after the rampage, voted to throw out election results. 155 members of Congress out of 535, that's 29 percent, voted to throw out election results after the rampage. But as I thought about my anger and, and why I'm kind of still processing it all, I thought less about the attack than sort of the weakness of our immune system. I mean, if you, if you analogize a body politic to a body, bodies are subject to attacks all the time. Viruses, bacteria, a fall, an auto accident. Bodies are subject to attacks all the time. We have an immune system, and it's a system. Lymph nodes, white blood cells, adenoids, a spleen, it's a system. And it has to work together to try to protect us or help us heal after an attack. I think we got a problem in the United States and in democracies in the world, our immune systems are weak. We, when we were under attack from the Russians in the election of 2016, the response of the Obama administration was tepid. And, and, and the fact that 30% of Congress after the attack that day would still vote to throw out election results, well, no, they should be standing up for an election. They, they shouldn't be standing on the side of the attackers. And so these institutions, if they're not the adenoids in the spleen, but what, what would the equivalent be? The, the free press and popular sovereignty and voting and educational institutions and NGOs and alliances like those we celebrate here. Our democracies are in need of some love and the immune system is what needs to be strengthened. We can do what we want to limit attacks, but there will always be attacks of one kind or another. It could be cyber, it could be terrorist attack but our immune systems are down and we have to figure out a way as we sort of exit this period of pandemic, God willing, to, to start to restore the immune systems in the body politic. Dr. McKeeley, I wonder if you could take us to your part of the world and, and what you are, what you believe is the biggest threat and, and what you get when you combine a population explosion with climate change. I think just taking off from what Senator Kane said, we're living in a time where our traditional norms no longer stand. So it's becoming more and more difficult to really understand how do we, be, how do we become more human in the next half of this century. Mm -hmm. I sit in the Horn of Africa, uh, West Africa, and I, what I see is these changing uh, norms, the things that I grew up with that I took for granted, I can no longer depend on them. Uh, for example, nobody ever thought what happened in the US Capitol would happen, but we see that every day, where the goalposts are changing. I'd like to talk about four different things that are changing very briefly. Um, and I see that as really opportunities and challenges, opportunities to do better, but also challenges that if we don't really tackle them properly, they will become the next whatever. Let me start with population. Uh, you mentioned population and the growth of the Nigerian population in particular. W in Africa, we've always thought of our population as a strength, and we have projected it as such. Mm -hmm. But I go to villages, I go to communities where I see thousands and thousands of people. What I see is hunger, not enough resources, not enough access to education. I see girls being married off at age 11, age 12. I see... Um, population becoming a weapon in itself. 
where we're fighting for mm. uh, not only resources, but we're fighting for our identity. As we grow bigger, we're getting smaller. People want to exist in smaller and smaller and smaller groups. Uh, so the population has not been an asset. And you combine that with climate change. We're in the throes of really a massive climate problem across the world, but most particularly in Africa. We're faced with the encroachment of the desert. Our lakes are shrinking all over Africa. Uh, we don't have, because of population, we don't have the land that we had. So you have a lot of people who live on subsistence farming. There's no land for them to farm on anymore. There's no land for them to even live on. So, uh, and also in the last couple of years, we've had increase in flooding. So that also has reduced the landmass that people used to rely on. The second thing I, uh, I see is the issue of communication and technology. Communication and technology has changed lives and communities in Africa, mostly for the good. I go to villages and I see people, because it's so cheap, I see people in the remotest villages, mm -hmm. in the poorest places, with a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that they have access to some sort of healthcare. Sometimes they have access to socioeconomic uh, empowerment because now they can access market from their phones and from their houses. They don't have to leave their house. So I've seen that really transform communities. But at the same time, I've also seen the detrimental effects of communication. I mean, I work with Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa. Mm. I see them using these same tools to mobilize, to recruit, uh, to, to gather communities together. And I also see the damage that it's done to uh, a lot of teenage girls uh, on Instagram, and I'll talk about mental health last, um, but I've seen the damage that it does. So uh, combined with COVID, um, we've had um, lockdowns in Nigeria, which has created uh, a, a lot of stress on communities because the communities that I work in during lockdowns, we couldn't access them. So they were left without basic services. And we've also seen um, an increase in, in gender-based violence during lockdown. It's gone way up and uh, the provision of services has shrunk. But what we've also seen is uh, terrorists moving into those spaces where they are providing uh, governance type structures. Uh, they're providing food, they're providing medical services. So they're gaining the trust of the people. We've left a vacuum where they have mm. um, really uh, positioned themselves and gaining the trust of the people. And finally, uh, trauma. I've seen trauma increase in the last two decades. I think we started this conference with Peter talking about everybody has lost something. And I think that's true. As a people, as a community, as a society, and as a world, we have lost a lot in the last uh, probably two decades. Uh, what we haven't gained is uh, an increase in the understanding of trauma and also ability for everybody who needs it to access it. I think that's going to be a big problem in the future. Mm. Joao, you were saying before about Afghanistan, I want to give you the chance to expand on it. How do we uh, prevent Afghanistan from becoming the source of the next 9-11, if, if it were a violent issue? And, and, and the opportunities that you pointed out specifically, <coughs> talk about that. You know, one, the Taliban are not entrenched, and, and we have a unique international consensus today. Well, well, first of all, we are in a much weaker, generally overall, and I think we, when we say we, um, I'm kind of assuming that there is, a, a, we're talking about the Western world, um, uh, primarily the United States as a, as a, as a world leader, uh, 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 you know, in, in terms of the, the fighting the threat that, that we were engaged in in the last 20 years. Um, that we are in a much weaker position than we were in, uh, by virtue of the fact that we don't have much leverage. Um, uh, but so let's look at opportunities. What, what are, if, if at all? Um, uh, I think primarily uh, one of the opportunities I see in terms of our ability to, uh, to, to prevent the, the next attack is the fact that there, uh, there is a region, of, there's a, quite a unique consensus I see that has emerged after the withdrawal of, the, uh, of foreign troops uh, between the regional countries uh, and the rest of the world um, on the fact that Taliban should be held accountable, uh, among other things, uh, on, uh, in, in terms of their commitment to 
uh, prevent Afghanistan being used by other, other, other extremist groups against, uh, against its neighbors, but also generally the rest of the world. Um, obviously, when it comes to the region, different countries are interested for their own sort of, you know, kind of, for lack of better words, selfish reasons. They all have their own pet groups um, that, don't, uh, that, 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 uh, that they don't want Taliban to uh, provide protection for. Uh, but, I th but obviously, because they cannot specifically say that, uh, they, there is this general pressure on the Taliban that they cannot be seen to be providing sanctuary and support. And for, for the Taliban, the region is important uh, now. Uh, the second opportunity is, is, if I may call it an opportunity, and as I mentioned earlier, I think it would be a mistake to, to expect the Taliban or depend on the Taliban to deliver uh, uh, on their commitment to, uh, first of all, even to distance themselves from these very groups because in their roots, they are at the same, uh, you know, let's face it, they are the same. They are part and parts of the same global extremist. Now, some may have a more regional uh, focus, some may have global focus, but fundamentally they are the same. And even, uh, even though it's not a priority for the Taliban right now, and they have some rivalries with, let's say, with ISIS, for example, right now, um, but if they continue the way they are, um, you know, it's not uh, unimaginable that they will fall back to their default position of, of actually being completely influenced by, by Al-Qaeda, by, uh, even by ISIS. Sometimes, who, who knows that right now they're fighting the, uh, ISIS, but three months from now, six months from now, maybe there is some sort of rapprochement that will be maybe facilitated or, uh, by, by some other group. Um, so, um, nonetheless, uh, while the opportunity is there that the Taliban still say, okay, that they're committed to whatever commitments they made in Doha, uh, there should be an engagement to hold them accountable for that. But I'll come to my final point. Even that, with, despite the regional consensus that you see, for example, on this question, even though on many others, you, you know, you, obviously the US and, and, and Russia and China don't see eye to eye, but in terms of the, the, the terrorist threat from Afghanistan, there is, by and large, an agreement. Um, so that could be used an, as an asset. Taliban's commitment could be used an, as an asset. But the final po uh, important thing is the Afghan society itself. Because uh, when we call we Afghans, and by we, we mean the you know, people that were associated in, in, uh, with the Islamic Republic, when we call for pluralism and inclusion, uh, 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 right now, it's not a luxury. It's not like we, you know, we, we want this as an, you know, a, a, as an add-on. Uh, we think that is fundamental to security. Uh, a Taliban that's uh, part of a more inclusive, broad-based, and somewhat democratic system, and uh, 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 in, in not a, um, a an autocratic. Uh, a, a government like it is right now, uh, that Taliban will be m will find it much more difficult to then fall back to its default position of being part of a, a global jihadist uh, network, because then it will be accountable to some sort of a populace, some sort of a uh, within Afghanistan, and and globally. Uh, but if we keep, uh, but if the Taliban continue the way they are. Uh, uh, and basically uh, uh, exclusionary rather than inclusion, uh, inclusive and also aut autocratic and, and, and uh, um, uh, uh, the way they are, uh, then I, I, don't, I, I don't really buy uh, any sort of verbal commitment by them to say that they will oppose uh, other extremist groups because I know uh, that that deep um, sort of faith-based or whatever the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, motivational uh, reasons that, uh, you know, that have, have kept Taliban together in the last 20 years, even much more than 20 years, will eventually prevail and, and that will be the basis for how Taliban can provide, um, you know, a, a very strong potentially sanctuary for, for, for those kind of forces. So it's a very, very important time for, for action, but, but, but the way to do it is 
uh, bombings, uh, you know, uh, uh, with due respect to a lot of the military leaders that are there, uh, this whole uh, over the horizon um, surgical military response to potential threats, we just saw it for 20 years that uh, uh, the, the effect mm -hmm. of that. It's mm. not going to work. Mm. For God's sake, the, the way to do it is to become a little clever, smarter about this. And the way to g get smart about this is to build, to, to uh, work with, with, with local uh, people and genuinely empower them to oppose that, that threat rather than for you to. Uh, so, so to do it is to be really emphasize inclusivity. I think that's the, um, uh, 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 the, the shortest way, I would say. Fatima, are we seeing terrorist groups in sub-Saharan Africa expand and communicate more closely? Yes, and I'm really worried about the, uh, what's happening in Afghanistan because it could be taken as an inspiration for a lot of terrorist groups. And um, what we've seen is that they become very, very clever. Just like we collaborate on the global scale and you have these global systems, so do terrorists. Uh, they are working with uh, terrorist groups across the Sahel and, um, for example, Iswap and Boko Haram are working with Al-Qaeda type groups and they're also working with ISIS. But what I find much more worrying is that now you see uh, right-wing extremist groups and uh, Islamically based ideological terror groups really operating in very similar ways. So they're either talking to each other or they're getting inspiration from each other. I think one thing that we should not underestimate is the imagination of terrorist groups mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and their reach. So uh, even when they are not, uh, they are happy to lay low for years. And uh, during that time that they learn low, they are plotting, they're planning, they're talking. In Nigeria, we see them uh, sharing resources and, and uh, collaboration with bandits. So it goes. To, uh, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if you will see more of an alliance in future between right-wing extremist groups with these kinds of ideologically based terror groups. Constanza, take us to the heart of Europe and the metastasization of a right-wing threat in Germany and, and whether that last point is, is the case. We're, we are seeing, maybe if not an alliance, some sharing of, of tactics uh, from uh, Islamist extremism, right-wing extremism, uh, and the, the, the homegrown, domestic, right-wing, violent uh, extremists that we've seen in Germany. That was a really hard cut. Um, <laughs> let me just... I think we should plant one point here about Afghanistan that I think should not be forgotten, which is that uh, Afghanistan under the Taliban is heading for one of the worst humanitarian crises the world has seen in decades, right? Hunger, deprivation, depredations. And it will be very difficult for us to find ways of getting basic sustenance, life-saving, means of sustenance to the suffering people of Afghanistan. And I think we should not leave that out of this discussion. I do also think, um, if I, you'll give me, indulge me in remaining with, the Afga with Afghanistan for, for yet one moment, that the Taliban will find the Afghanistan of 2021 a little harder to, to, to govern than the, than the, than, than the Afghanistan mm -hmm. of the 1990s. Because as Fatima is saying, it's not just Nigerians or uh, Malians, Senegalese who have, who have cell phones, it's also the Afghans. Afghan society is now networked and is able to communicate in ways that it wasn't 20 years ago. And I think that the Taliban, sophisticated as they are at using these means themselves, will find that the uh, Afghan civil societies will have ways of putting out counter narratives and of getting information out there, and it will be much harder for them to exercise control over Afghanistan politically and militarily. And I think that will be very interesting. Uh, that, that's not going to make it any easier for the West or any, you know, uh, any less weighing on our conscience, but I just wanted to put those two things out there. Um, now, <laughs> right-wing extremism. Um, let me perhaps try and build that bridge that you sort of just jumped over. Which is, <laughs> just so we take the whole rest of the audience with us. Um, and that is that as somebody who was defense and security editor of my, of my newspaper at, at that time and had to cover uh, Kosovo Air War, Afghanistan, I was on an embed list for Iraq when GMF hired me in 2005. Um, 
I have to say that I had real intellectual and practical policy reservations um, when the entirety of the Western world decided that the new paradigm of international relations was going to be the global war on terror. And I think the last persons I have to explain that to here are those of you who are senior military officers. Uh, because most generals and admirals that I talked to at the time thought that this was an extremely bad idea and was going to, they're going to make their life harder rather than easier, which is why um, the, the, this notion was dropped um, some way along. But it had, I think it had two particularly detrimental consequences. Um, and I can think of several more if you let me, but I will, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be brief. And wh one is that I think that it was, an, it was a, as an intellectual concept, concept, it was a Procrustean bed. It was a sort of very facile binary mm -hmm. uh, that, that just, you know, bulldozed over the complexities of regional and local power struggles in which religion played a role, but no, mind, no means the only role. Um, and, and we sort of found ourselves in, you know, embroiled in all, sorts of, mm. in all sorts of regional engagements from Afghanistan to Libya to Iraq, which we realized that we knew rather less about than we should have if we were going to get entangled in these places, right? I don't have to explain that to anybody here either. But the other thing, that, the other problem, that's where this, my bridge begins, is that I think this was a massive distraction. Um, a, a, an obsessive focus on explosive forms of violence, which turned out to be a massive distraction from the, from the changes that it wrought, not just in the international order, but in our domestic societies, and in the way that we made policy and conducted ourselves politically. We saw a massive expansion of executive powers, a massive expansion of the powers of the secret state, police powers and intelligence powers in addressing threats at home with little to zero judiciary and legislative oversight with real consequences for the separation and balance of powers in our constitutional orders. And I think we saw a legitimation of culture war narratives, of xenophobia, and it racialized much of the discourse of, of policing in our own societies. And when that hit Western societies with a legacy of slavery or of decolonization, that mixture became absolutely toxic. And that happened in America, it happened in all the countries of Europe, and then happened in my country, certainly. And it made us blind. It made us blind to the, to the burgeoning networks of right-wing terrorism. And the ex example that you and I talked about earlier, which I will finish with, is that for 10 years, a, a, a band of um, murdering right-wing terrorists went around Germany killing Germans of Turkish origin. And the domestic intelligence services on our state level all thought that this was intra-Turkish gang warfare, mm. or didn't think mm. so, but said so just all the same, despite having to, uh, uh, that they should, should have known better. And it was only after the passage of 10 years that everybody realized that this had actually been a hard right extremist network. And I think it is then that we realized that we had for about a decade or so since 9-11 or longer, um, treated cases of, of right wing extremism, extremism as a lone wolf, remember Oklahoma City in 1995, and failed to realize that there were developing networks that were indeed also learning from Islamist networks. Yeah. And these organizations are now, uh, shall we say, affiliated in some cases, and certainly in my country, with the more institutionalized forms of, of, of the hard right that have made their way into politics and into the legislatures. And that, I think, is a consequence that leads us to January 6th, but also leads us to the, the German election of 2017, where the AFD entered the Bundestag. And while the AFD has been plateauing in my country, they got in, in two states in this last election in September in first place, in Thuringia and Saxony. Mm -hmm. And in a country of my history, I think that is a complete and utter scandal. Senator Kane, I have to ask you to make a right turn as well. And, and uh, we're basically out of time, uh, and I do want to open it up to some questions. So I'm going to ask you a big question. I'm going to ask you, apologize in advance to be brief. We've got to talk about COVID. The Chinese are not allowing a proper investigation right. into the origins. Will we ever know 
the origins of COVID? And what does the answer to that question say about whether we can prevent the next one? Um, you know, I, I think even in the last couple of days in the United States, more information have, has come out that put some weight on the, um, you know, the market leak theory. But we don't have all the information. China is not ever going to let us have it. Um, so I'm going to take your COVID question. I'm going to flip it around. Problems do provide opportunity for solutions. Um, Senator Coons and I, we were in the Americas in July when the U.S. was delivering massive vaccines. We were slower out of the gate than China and Russia because it takes us a longer time to approve them, and we were trying to deal with our own internal vaccination. But we were there when a million and a half vaccines came into Guatemala, a million and a half came into Ecuador, and what we were hearing um, in these countries was, wow, we like the quality of the U.S. vaccines the best. You're kind of the gold standard. You're giving them to us. China and Russia are selling them to us and then not delivering often on the contract. And if we say something nice about Taiwan, then the, it gets canceled. And basically, you know, if, if you look at the, the, the mass challenge, there is still a mass need in the world for good health policy, public health, innovation, vaccine delivery. And with China stonewalling and, and canceling vaccines to nations that say something nice about Taiwan, I do think there's an opportunity for the United States and other innovative democracies to go out and be for health and, and do vaccine deliveries and not have strings attached. We don't, you know, we don't care what you say about American politics. We're not, we're not asking for anything. We're going to deliver it to you, and then we're going to try to produce more and deliver more. So. I, I, your, your last question was, what is our inability to have complete knowledge about China, say, about our ability to prevent the next pandemic? There is a gap there. But, but also, let's be clear to the world about who's helping and who's not. Um, let's, let's make very plain who are, the, who are trying in an imperfect way to find solutions and who are blocking solutions. Um, and that, that can create some commonality and goodwill. And that commonality and goodwill will help us deal with the next pandemic, whether it's a virus or some other, some other global problem. All right, we're going to try and let you guys get to lobsters. Uh, so I will take two questions, uh, and, and we'll, we'll get going after that. Uh, all right, this gentleman here on, on the left side first, and I'll come back to this side after. Uh, my name is Ram Mathav. I come from India. I have been the National General Secretary of the ruling BJP there. 9-11 uh, came to symbolize the worst form of radical Islamist ideology for the entire world. 20 years down the line, that threat remains intact, not just for America, but for many countries in the world. I come from that part of the world, South Asia, which has been victim of this uh, terror much before U.S. became victim in an 9-11. Mm -hmm. So my one is my observation, one second will be my question. My observation is that we all must first of all have clarity over the serious threat that ideology poses to the entire humanity. When I say humanity, radical Islamist terror. Sir, it's if I could ask are, you to get to your question, please. Uh, it's victims, uh, because uh, just ten, 10 seconds, it's victims are Muslims are as much its victims as many others are in the West, in the East, everywhere. So my simple submission, first thing is, I feel it utter trivialization to equate it with some political movements, domestic movements, some attack on uh, Congress and all these things. They are serious issues for you. They are domestic problems. But to equate such big issue with political issues will be a big mistake. Then you are definitely inviting another 9-11. My question simply is, since we are trying to equate 9-11, uh, so, I mean, coming back to 9-11, to, to Taliban, sorry. my question is, and this, is, this observation is important because you try to trivialize it according to me. Uh, my question is, what do we do with Taliban now in order to avoid another 9-11? Do you want to engage with them? Or do you want them to go? On that, can we build any consensus? In any case, simple point, 9-11 was not by Taliban, right. it was by Al-Qaeda. We'll, we'll get to Jawad. Jawad, quick, 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 quick uh, answer on that, please. Yeah, no, no, it, well, I, I appreciate the question because I, I think I 
I, I should have answered this as part of uh, the, the last part of what I said earlier about being smart about this rather than thinking about um, you know, having the, uh, a, a purely military strategy. Uh, engaging with the Taliban would be th would be the first step, uh, not just to hold them accountable to the commitments that they've made, um, but but also to um, you know you know be, what other leverage to to gain some sort of a leverage which which we don't have right now. Um, and engagement uh, should also include other than just you know specifically uh, focusing on this question of their commitment um, to also. Um, uh, hold them accountable for for, for governance um, and uh, the, the, you know, the humanitarian situation, this uh, situation of the rights and freedoms of, of the Afghan people, um, and and also notably the the question of uh, of the future of of some sort of a pluralistic uh, system of government. Because as I say, I repeat once again, because that is the 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 surest way uh, that I can think of uh, that Afghanistan will not um, fall back to, um, uh, not just to influence, but control of, of extremist forces. Uh, and, and one last element in terms of this engagement uh, would go beyond the Taliban, and that would be the regional. Uh, what I mentioned earlier about some sort of an opportunity that's there, because a lot of people agree that this is a threat. Um, I encourage that there should be a, 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 an approach to uh, re building Consensus at the regional level and engaging with them on this on this question. Consensus, you want to quickly jump in on that? Mm -mm. No. Okay. All right. Next question uh, over on the right side. Um, let's see. I, I, th I think I saw that hand first. Thank you. I'm. Uh, you, you can drop your mask while you ask the question. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dolkun Isa. I'm the president of the World Uyghur Congress. I'm the Uyghur origin from Germany. So. Uh, we saw the September 11 video. This is September 11 is a turning point, a lot of things of the world, but for the China as well. After September 11, Chinese government changed language and used U United States war against the, uh, terrorism. Just China said, we are victims of the terrorism and start and uh, uh, crack down the Uyghurs, Uyghurs. So today, it's 3 million Uyghurs Muslim are in the concentration camps. But at the China, same time, also start already the war against the Islam. All values of Islam is uh, uh, attacked. But now is China's biggest support of the Taliban and the alliance, big alliance, no. Uh, but Taliban uh, saying themselves is uh, United Islamic Emirates themselves. So one side is targeting value of Islam, other side is saying we are uh, protecting the value of Islam. So how long this friendship between China and the Taliban <laughs> continue? <laughs> I believe both is liar, but how long will we continue? Thank you. Who wants to jump in on China and Taliban? I mean, I can address it, sure, but I've yeah. spoken yeah. already. But well, I mean, I'll just say something really quick. <clears throat> it's not a friendship. It's yeah. managing a potential risk. And, and as long, because of China's proximity to Afghanistan, and they'll do what they need to do and say what they need to say and reverse their position in a minute, China will, um, and say the opposite thing tomorrow than they're saying today if they think that's what they need to do to manage the risk. The U.S. was managing, I mean, we were not in Afghanistan to do this, but we were managing a risk for China, and we were managing a risk mm -hmm. for other nations, and, and they were getting a risk managed on our dime and on the death of a lot of Americans. Um, now they've got a risk on their own borders that they have to manage themselves. And so it's not a friendship, and it'll never be a friendship. It'll be a risk management strategy, and they'll say anything or do anything and change it at will to try to manage a risk. And uh, Very quickly. that was a yeah. brilliant answer, Senator. Uh, but just I will add one other element to that, and that's that they are being brutally pragmatic uh, about, about this question, as the Senator said. Uh, with the reason they are, they are as concerned as, as, as everyone else, but, uh, but the other element is the role of Pakistan. Because Pakistan has had historically very deep uh, linkages with Taliban, and right now as we speak, uh, Pakistan, there is a sense that Pakistan is confident that it has a control over, over the Taliban and it's, um, you know, it's manageable. 
So Pakistan, um, so Ch Chinese government has actually, uh, you know, uh, basically subcontracted that to them and, and just um, are happy to, to, to take Pakistan's word uh, on that one. Um, so yeah, so in a way that it, it's, it's I think the role of Pakistan which should not be left out of this conversation com comes into uh, qu question as well. I'm told I have one more. I just want to make sure I'm not uh, missing anyone. Uh, all right, I believe in the third row on the right, the blue tie. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very unusual. Hmm. Hi, uh, Vagam Radian from Defense and Aerospace Report. Uh, the, the question I have is, if you look at right-wing movements all around the world, they're gaining ground. Everybody says that democracies are eventually going to win, win this. Peter deserves a lot of credit for a very moving and very thoughtful address on how it is we need to be viewing this. But in the United States, large parts of the American population no longer live in what most people would consider reality. Similarly, in element, I, I don't mean to be funny about it because I don't think it's funny. But, so ultimately, how is it we fight this battle hmm. as democracy? And Sansa, you want to start? Well, I think that's a really good point. And my, my Brookings colleague, Jonathan Rauch, uh, has just written a book called The Constitution of Knowledge, in which he speaks of epistemological secession and epistemological warfare. Uh, and that's not just happening in America, that's happening in other cultures as well, including in mine in Germany. And it is one of the hardest things to grapple with because it, it, it literally means that, that it is almost impossible to get these groups to talk to each other anymore, right? I, I find that so profoundly distressing in a, in a democracy. Um, I, the, the problem with this right now is that so many of the risks appear to me immediate and short term, whereas the recipes that we need to look at to address mm -hmm. these issues mm -hmm. would be long term and, and addressing the structural questions, the, the, the societal, yeah. economic, and political degradation of governance and the provision of public goods in Western democracies. That is where we are. Yeah. And I mean, since this is a security forum, it the state of our democracies limits the political capital and the bandwidth that our policymakers and politicians have to make foreign and security policy. Let there be no mistake. The next Afghanistan or Iraq or Libya will look very different because of this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I, I have to say I'm profoundly concerned. Senator Kane and I were talking about this earlier. I studied America. I have a law degree. I wrote my doctoral thesis about American constitutional law. For me, I, I have a, I have a fair, I, as a student, I had a sort of a reverence for American constitutional tradition yeah. because I thought it had achieved something that my country it took, you know, several wars and world wars and, and horrific depredations uh, to achieve. And it's, I, I, I find it really hard to grapple with the fact that this country would let things come so far. Quick point from Senator Kane, and then Fatima will, will, will have the last word. I'm, I'm still old fashioned. So, so Lincoln in that speech in 1838 did get around to solutions. And Grant gave a very similar speech in 1875 in Des Moines, Iowa, actually, where he talked about this division. And he posited solutions. And they were the same ones that Jefferson posited. Mm -hmm. Jefferson said, progress in government and all else depends upon the broadest possible diffusion of knowledge among the general population. Mm -hmm. We still have such inequities in our country. A lot of the yeah. you know, right wing movements and people who are mad. There's such inequities in terms of how they're portrayed in the media, their access to educational opportunities. We've just passed a bipartisan infrastructure bill that will make massive broadband investments so people in rural America will have the same access to information as others. Now, Fatima pointed out that communications stuff can have a, a dark side too. There's no good side that can't have a dark side to it. But making sure that people are connected and they're not left out because they live in an urban neighborhood or they're left out because they live in rural America. We can do that through educational investments. We can do that through things like broadband. And I think that will, that will start to redress some serious societal imbalances that, that still sadly are too And of course, powerful. and, and Fatima, you're, you're seeing those imbalances uh, uh, in your part of the world. Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, I'd like to echo what Constance and uh, Senator uh, Kane said. Um, I think we just need to pay attention. Why is it that 
um, so many people are feeling left out, disenfranchised, yeah. marginalized, not part of society. And uh, they are slowly uh, becoming bigger and bigger groups that are feeling like that. And it's not just the United States with the far right groups, it's all over the world. Is there any country that doesn't have such a group? I, I think there isn't. And when we're talking about this, uh, this panel is about the next 9-11. What is the next 9-11? If we focus so much on what is before us, uh, what is in the media glare, what is happening today, we miss so many other things. We have to be more nuanced. We have to look wider. Right now, uh, the microscope is on Afghanistan, quite rightly, but so many other things are happening everywhere. And if we focus so narrowly, uh, we're going to wake up tomorrow and something's going to pop up somewhere that we didn't see it. So we just have to have a much wider lens. I'd like to end on that note. That is a great point. Thank you so much to everyone. Hey. This concludes today's program. Please join us at Pier 21 for a gala dinner. You may walk there or take a shuttle. Departures are from the main lobby.